What's up everybody, Matt Brand here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting and very interesting news to go over here this week. So the first news story here is actually about Ford and how they've patented a new type of manual transmission, which has all kinds of interesting ideas in it here. So Muscle Cars and Trucks reported late last week um, they discovered this new Ford patent. Um, and so the patent was recently published and discovered, but the patent itself actually dates back to 2018, which means everything I'm talking about here potentially has had several years to be developed to the point that we could see this kind of stuff on a next generation Mustang here coming in a year or so. Um, so this sounds very promising though and could potentially save the manual transmission as well uh, depending on how well it's executed if it does in fact come in a production vehicle. So um, essentially the patent creates a way to get rid of the physical connection between the clutch pedal and the throwout bearing um, and instead make it a digital connection kind of like brake by wire, you know, throttle by wire, all that type of stuff. And essentially the patent seems to you know, make it seem so that it works very similar to like an auto rev match thing um, where it's basically using sensors to uh, sense when you're trying to start shifting and automatically you know blipping the throttle with the rev mashing you know that's been something that's been around for a while now and so kind of just extending that into the clutch operation as well so um, yeah, it uses an algorithm to go along with that to intelligently sense, you know, what it you know needs to do. Uh, but basically, what it's what the patent describes is when it senses your hand starting to move the shifter, it would disengage the clutch, then re-engage once you're done with the shiftment, the shifting motion there. Um, and so it allows you to drive a manual in normal driving circumstances without using the clutch. It would do the clutch for you because again, the clutch pedal, if there is one, would just be a switch, and so. Basically, it kind of takes out all the work whenever you're in the non-fun manual driving of, you know, stop and go traffic, things like that. And that's the biggest reason why a lot of people say, you know, oh, I'd love a manual, but I just sit in so much traffic and I don't want to be bothered with a clutch. This would give you the best of both worlds, essentially, and it's kind of brilliant. Um, but this tech also opens up uh, two other possibilities here that are kind of interesting. So... Um, you know, for some people, they could just go without the clutch completely, or Ford could choose to just not offer clutch whatsoever. But I think, you know, the way they're describing this patent, they want to still give people the option to have manual control over the clutch still if they want. And so there's two different things they laid out here. The first describes Ford still having a clutch pedal that's, you know, just a switch. Um, and then this would allow the driver to override the system to dump or slip the clutch as desired. So, you know, it could be an optional clutch that you use if you feel like it. You know, if you're someone who does want to feel every, you know, shift with the clutch pedal and everything, you could still do that and still drive it like a normal manual, it sounds like. Uh, you know, you just might not have the same kind of uh, sense of connection with the clutch pedal since, you know, the feedback would be artificial if there is any feedback at all. Um, but, you know, it could, you know, offer that as well as opening up the possibility so that you can, you know, do some more aggressive launches there and stuff if you want. Um, and so... That's interesting that they could do that, but then another way that Ford could allow this manual clutch control is through the shift knob, according to the patent. The patent uh, describes either a button or having the actual knob itself be pressure sensitive so that when you squeeze the shifter, um, it could open or slip the clutch, um, allowing you to dump it just by like squeezing the shifter really hard, um, like whenever you're in first potentially. And then you, you know, let off of the shifter there in first and that dumps the clutch and you take off. It would kind of force some relearning of how to drive a manual, of course. Um, you know, just a little bit of an adjustment period there. So I'm thinking that maybe that's a little farther out. I'm not sure if that will, you know, if that isn't an option, it'll only be in addition to maybe having a clutch pedal if they, you know, decide to do something like this. Um, but that all sounds actually really promising in my opinion. And, you know, again, I think it kind of would give more people the option of driving a manual. And it also gets rid of the intimidation factor because obviously this would prevent you from ever stalling the vehicle. Um, even if you do take control with that, you know, manual control, I'm assuming that it would intervene if it's sensing that you're going to kill the engine. And so, you know, one, it's really good for that reason because it takes out the intimidation factor and may basically opens up the manual to anyone who wants to move their right arm. Um, you know, that's all it's going to take basically, which is awesome. And it also opens up the potential for hybridization along with still having a manual. I know that the Honda CRZ has, you know, did a manual with the hybrid a long time ago, but this would allow them to be able to have control over the engine for the hybrid stuff, which is something they like doing with these hybrid setups. So it would allow them to take over that 
that control, um, but then open up that control to you whenever you know the conditions are met where you're not running in EV mode, rolling in traffic or whatever the case might be, but it would allow that. And there's been talk of you know there being hybridization here for all the powertrains for the next generation Mustang. So this might actually be like necessary for them to incorporate all that stuff together. Again, that's, you know, unconfirmed. That's just a hunch. But, um, you know, it's just, it all sounds like really good news to me. I mean, yes, you know, I know the purists are going to want, you know, a physical connection there, but we've learned to live with brake by wire, with electronic throttle response, electronic power steering. Yes, these things might be downgrades in your mind, but, you know, we still have really fun cars with steer by wire, brake by wire, um, on and on, you know, so, you know, I think that I'd rather see this evolution than see the manuals go away completely, which is the reality that we're seeing with most other sporty vehicles out there. So if, you know, that's what it comes down to, I would very happily take this. And so, uh, a very interesting patent and we'll see, you know, what happens again, this could end up being like all other patents that just kind of, you know, sits on a shelf and never gets used. But I think this has a lot of potential. I'm very excited whenever I'm, you know, hearing about these ideas. So fingers crossed. I'm actually hoping that actually makes production here for the new Mustang. Um, and there's a few official Ford stories here this week. So the first is that they fully revealed the Bronco Everglades here. And so it's a new trim that adds onto the Sasquatch package and gives you a unique bumper that includes a winch along with a snorkel, a unique grill, wheels, safari bar, rock rails, bash plates, fender graphics, all that stuff. The snorkel inc increases the water forty depth by about three inches and it's only three inches because the transmission and axles apparently still have limits as well and their vents were also raised but i guess that's kind of the limiting factor more so than where the air intakes at so but still three inches is a nice improvement and uh, strangely though this everglades trim is only going to be available with the smaller 2.3 liter engine i'm not sure if there's just an issue with the plumbing for the intake with the bigger engine that they can't you know, use the snorkel or what. Um, I don't know, but anyway, it goes on sale this summer and prices start at $54,195. Ford also has teased the new Ranger Raptor that the rest of the world is going to be getting, and we'll wait to see if we actually get it as well, although it seems kind of likely. But anyway, the full reveal of this vehicle is going to be happening on February 22nd, and in the meantime here we have a teaser video that goes along with it, and uh, from the way it sounds, at least this test vehicle doesn't seem to be running a diesel engine um, like the past Raptor uh, Rangers have, and so it's possible that you know there could be one offered still for parts of the world that get taxed by displacement, because in those parts of the world, you know, going from a two liter diesel to a three liter, you know, uh, twin turbo V6 would just, the taxes would be crazy and no one would buy it in those countries. So, you know, I think they still will probably stick with the older engine, you know, in some places, but the fact that, um, you know, they are probably going to be offering it with the twin turbo V6 and basically the same engine as the Bronco means that we should be getting it here in the States as well. And there's no reason why they can't offer this in the States. Um, We'll see, you know, if they just choose not to for some other reason, but, um, as for the changes we can see here for the uh, Ranger Raptor, it appears to be getting the usual Raptor upgrades with the beefier suspension, bigger tires, fender flares, the big Ford grille, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm not sure when we're going to even get the reveal of the regular Ranger here in the States. It's kind of strange. They're doing all these reveals overseas. Um, but then they're totally silent about it here in the States. It's like, we know that that's the new Ranger. There's no like mystery or anything, you know, so I'm not sure why they're not just being like, Hey, by the way, America, you'll be getting this as well. We'll just put some orange side marker lights on it and we'll send it over to you, you know, next year or something. I don't know, but for some reason we're still in the dark about the Ranger here in the States. Um, but I'm imagining it's gotta be coming sometime soon. If they're already rolling out the Raptor version for the rest of the world, hopefully, you know, we get the scraps of the regular Ranger here at some point soon. But anyway, interesting to see that. And the last uh, Ford news here is that we have the last edition of the Ford GT that was revealed here this week, uh, the Allen Mann Heritage Edition, which pays homage to the two prototype GT40s made in 1966 by Allen Mann Racing, and it copies their paint scheme, as you can see. It's still just really awesome that, you know, the Ford GT ever even existed for this new generation here, and um, it's sad to see that its production is ending this year. Now, I'm not sure if this is the final edition. Maybe there will be some actual edition edition called the final edition. I'm not sure. And, um, you know, but at least we do know that production is ending this year and, uh, that's just a very sad thing. It's just awesome that, you know, this thing existed and that it had the awesome racing career it had and everything else. So anyway, very cool to see that. 
And Alfa Romeo this week has revealed the Tonale SUV in its final production form here. It's a 2023 Tonale um, we finally see here. And uh, it looks fantastic in my opinion. It's going to slot beneath the Stelvio, but doesn't seem too much smaller than the Stelvio. But I think just, man, the styling is really sweet looking and um so as far as all the gritty details here of it it shares this platform with other small Stellantis SUVs so the wheelbase is identical to a Jeep Compass but before you complain about it just being a badge engineered Jeep Compass that is not the case so um it looks like it shares absolutely nothing with a Compass um as far as mechanical stuff goes as far as sheet metal interior nothing is the same so it must just be very simple basic stuff so this is not just some cost cutting you know garbage or anything so as you can see it's totally unique here on the outside and on the inside here you can see it gets a new 10.25 inch touchscreen running uconnect 5 along with a 12.3 inch digital gauge cluster with vintage looking gauges and i love those they look just like an old alfa romeo and i've been waiting for someone to do digital gauges that actually look retro and uh, i love the way those look anyway it also gets the awesome alfa romeo steering wheel with a huge aluminum column mounted paddle shifters and as far as power Power trains go. It runs a two liter turbo four that does 256 horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque, which is almost as much power as the Stelvio. And they claim that it is best in class power for this segment, which is the subcompact luxury SUV segments. So we're talking like Mercedes GLA, BMW X1, like that kind of stuff is what this is supposed to compete with. And those all do, you know, 200 odd horsepower, maybe 225 or something if you're lucky. So this is going to be, you know, the sportiest of the bunch here, especially almost 300 pound-feet of torque. And so that runs through a nine-speed automatic transmission and has all-wheel drive as standard. I am a little bummed it's not the awesome ZF8 speed. It sounds like it's uh, the in-house uh, nine-speed auto, but still should hopefully be a, you know, promising combo. There's also going to be a plug-in hybrid option that uses the 1.3 liter turbo four um, that's from the Renegade. So that is the only thing that might resemble the other Stellantis small SUVs because you'll have the Renegade little 1.3 liter turbo motor, but it's paired up with a rear axle electric motor and a 15.5 kilowatt hour battery for 272 horsepower and 30 miles of electric range. So that one actually has a little bit more uh, horsepower. I don't think we saw a torque figure for that one, but uh, they're saying that even that one should be pretty quick with uh, doing zero to 60 in six seconds flat. Again, for a subcompact, crossover that's very good and so it also has a bunch of other promising stuff here it's gonna be running a mcpherson strut suspension with adaptive dampers you can get as an option um but even the standard dampers have some variability to them that seems pretty interesting there's also four piston brembo brakes available and you can even have uh it's standard here it comes with a quick 13.6 to 1 steering ratio which gives you that signature quick alpha steering that I absolutely love and I've been obsessed with in the Julia and the Stelvio here over the past five years or so. So very excited about that. They also say it has 50-50 weight distribution, um, which would also help the handling of it. So, you know, I think that despite, you know, the bones, it should actually be very impressive in the handling department, performance department, and really live up to the Alfa Romeo name. And so I'm very excited to you know, try one of these out, but it's going to be a little bit of a wait here because they're not going to be arriving in the States until early 2023. I believe Europe will get it sometime this year but here in the states early 2023 um and no pressing has been given yet for those but you got to assume it's going to come in under the stelvio um so we're talking something somewhere in the thirty thousand dollar range you know of course but anyway very cool to see that in other plug-in hybrid news though kia has revealed the plug-in hybrid version of the 2023 sportage here so it uses the same setup as the sorrento plug-in hybrid and the tucson plug-in hybrid running a 1.6 liter turbo four cylinder a six-speed automatic and a 66.9 kilowatt electric motor power wasn't announced but it's likely going to be the same as the others which is uh, 261 horsepower and 258 pound feet of torque uh, but that hasn't been confirmed just yet what has been confirmed is it's going to have a 13.8 kilowatt hour battery and it can do 32 miles of electric range they say so very impressive still again not as much power or as much range as the RAV4 Prime which is still the king in this segment uh, but you know still will be a great extra option to have and it's uh, interestingly only going to be available in X-Line trim so X-Line and X-Line Prestige and that's it so it's going to be kind of locked out you know aside from those top few trims um, it's going to be arriving here in the third quarter of this year uh, and there's no pricing for those yet either but of course it'll be a little bit more expensive than uh, whatever they end up charging for the regular X-Line uh, Sportages so interesting to see that 
Chevy has given the Blazer a refresh here for the 2023 model year. And while it looks pretty subtle, when you compare it with the 2022, it's actually a pretty significant uh, change there to the styling. So you can see both in the front and in the back, you got some significant changes. Up front, it gets slimmer, more high-tech running lights there, and a larger grill and a bumper that's been re-sculpted to kind of make it a little uh, sportier. Out back, it gets new taillights and a new bumper and hatch design there, and the way they kind of painted things uh, kind of really changes up the, the visual there on the back. It also gets a two-tone combo option here with a black painted roof, and it also gets new wheels that range from 18 inches all the way up to 21s you can get on this thing if you want. Inside, it's going to be getting a bigger 10-inch touchscreen as standard across the board, and there's even a new blue interior option that unfortunately we don't have any pictures of, but blue interior always uh, perks my ears up, so I'm um, cool that they're offering that. Uh, mechanically, they're all going to be the same, so uh, no changes there, but they're going to be going on sale this summer, so cool to see that. And so some other GM news that's kind of interesting here. CEO Mary Barra uh, revealed on an earnings call last week that not only are they planning the $30,000 Equinox EV that they talked about at CES uh, you know, last month, but that they're also planning an even more affordable EV. And uh, whatever vehicle that is, um, it will almost certainly either replace the Bolt or take the Bolt's name, um, considering that production is going to be winding down on the Bolt just because they need that factory to build the other stuff that they're planning. Um, so the Bolt's future is a little uncertain, at least as far as the current vehicle on the current old electric platform is concerned. Um, and there was no other details given aside from that sub $30,000 price uh, category. Uh, but, you know, it just means that the Bolt definitely doesn't have much longer to live in its current generation. I do hope they keep the Bolt name, though. I think it's a really great name for an EV. And... You know, I think that, you know, the Bolt kind of has a little bit of recognition, at least among the EV, uh, you know, group. And so, you know, either way, though, it's just good news that, you know, not only is Chevy going to be offering a $30,000 EV, which these days with inflation and with the way pricing is going for cars, that's a pretty affordable EV. But to even have something in the $20,000 range, um, I think it's going to be very impressive. We'll see, you know, what that looks like and how much space it has and, you know, all that. But... Just the fact they're offering one and they're saying this is how they're differentiating themselves from all the electric car startups that are all going for $100,000 SUVs and stuff. They're getting in that realm as well, obviously, with all their big you know stuff. But they're really focusing on the affordable stuff as well, which I think is very commendable because you know, very few people can actually go out and drop a hundred grand on a Hummer or something. Um, you know, this is the stuff that's really going to matter for most people. And so I'm um, very exciting to hear they're working on that. Speaking of crazy hundred thousand dollar electric trucks though, uh, just last week I talked about the Ram Revolution name um, that was trademarked. And this week Ram has officially uh, revealed a teaser image and video for an electric Ram, uh, but also clarified that it, that might not actually be the name of the truck. They're talking about Ram Revolution and it's like this movement where they want to get a bunch of input from Ram owners and from others as far as what they want to see in an electric truck. And they're going to apparently be going around to various places all around the country this year and having like town hall meetings, like, like talking to people about what they want out of an electric truck and all this kind of stuff. So that kind of fits the Ram Revolution name a little bit more. And they're even setting up the website you can already go to is ramrevolution.com. Submit your uh, info and you can give them all your input and all that kind of stuff. But um, so they say the Ram revolution is coming, but you know, when they said that at the end of their uh, one teaser video, they're saying the Ram revolution is coming. You could take that multiple ways. You could say that the car, the Ram revolution is coming or that the revolution of the electric Rams is also coming. And, you know, so it's still a little foggy, but, uh, kind of cool. They've at least confirmed they are going to be using the name, uh, at least for this marketing thing, if nothing else. Um, and they also said, along with all these announcements, that, that they will push past what competitors have announced and what customers expect to deliver a fuller portfolio of technology with more range, power, productivity, and convenience. Um, but that isn't all because actually at Autoblog learned during an interview with Ram CEO at the Chicago Auto Show this week um, that Ram plans to offer a range extender version of this electric Ram, but they didn't provide any details about that. But that could be a key differentiator between this and you know, the Lightnings and the Silverado EVs and all that kind of stuff. Because if you still have a small little gas engine to at least generate power, even if it's not actually hooked up to move the truck, but if you have that on board, 
to generate electricity, that could help to offset some of the huge uh, losses in range you get when you're towing, which is something that you know a lot of truck buyers at least would like the idea of being able to do, even if they don't actually tow as much as uh, you know a lot of people pretend they do. You know, at least it would give them that flexibility to be like, hey, let's you know top off the little gas extender thing and you know run the charger to you know offset that, so you still have decent electric range even when you're towing. And just you know another cool little thing to you know. Again, just think outside the box and not just try and load it up with a million batteries and have thousands of miles of range, but saying, hey, you know, we can still have a gas engine in here, you know, for people who do need that. And I think it would be a nice backup too for people who just want an electric truck, but maybe they're a little bit nervous and they want to have some type of backup. You know, you have your little gas thing, you can keep it going just to do the basic driving you need to do or something. So anyway, very interesting to hear all of that and uh, so we'll see how this ram develops you know we're hearing it's not going to come you know until about 2024 so we still have a little ways to go but uh very interesting to watch this develop and for some other ev stellantis news here citroen's uh, ds sub brand in france revealed the e-tense performance concept which not only looks awesome here but also has some insane specs to back up the crazy looks so it uses a carbon fiber monocoque and two electric motors for 815 horsepower and 5900 pound feet of torque at the wheels and so that claim has been exaggerated that's what tesla was doing whenever they claimed the cybertruck had 10,000 pound feet of torque or whatever um but still a massive amount of torque um and so that basically this powertrain is coming straight out of their uh formula e car so you know that's why it's you know pretty crazy and uh unfortunately though they say that this car that you're seeing here is only a high performance laboratory and doesn't preview a future production car so womp womp but i mean you know this just goes to show you though this is what Solantis is working with in their arsenal so when they're talking about crazy you know electric muscle cars 815 horsepower and a new hellcat electric thing or something totally possible and if you have thousands of pound feet of torque um you know that should silence everybody at the drag strip whenever you're, you're doing these launches and probably doing you know sub 10 second quarter mile times and these things you know easily um it's going to be pretty wild so you know it's just very cool that they're developing this uh you know all these motors and this platform and all that kind of stuff and should provide us with a lot of sweet performance stuff here in just a few years so interesting to see that Ferrari this week has revealed a little interesting nugget of info in their most recent annual report. So it claims that the long-awaited Ferrari Pura Songway SUV will be starting production this year and the deliveries will begin in 2023. And so we still really don't have too much info on the Pura Songway. Um, there's some spy shots that were shown and it looks like it's going to be a little bit smaller and still a little more hatchback-like. Honestly, from the spy shots, it, it just kind of seems like a slightly higher four-door GTC4 Lusso just by what I've been seeing but we'll see what they do with it hopefully we get some kind of reveal sometime this year and get more details on it then we still don't even know like what engine it's running or anything like that so we'll see about all that but very interesting to at least know when it's now coming um in other exotic car news here autocar has a new report out about the future of aston martin and uh the aston martin vantage db11 and dbs specifically so aston's chairman lawrence stroll revealed at the dbx 707 launch uh, which happened last week and i covered that vehicle last week if you missed that um but at that event, um, he was talking about all three sports cars and how they're going to be getting heavy reworks to make them more like all new cars um, with changes to each car's suspension, engines, transmissions, and interiors, including the infotainment system. And he was pretty blunt here because he said, finally, Aston Martin gets touchscreens and admits that the old agreement with Mercedes was silly because it required them to put three-year-old tech from Mercedes vehicles in their car. So Mercedes came out with the new infotainment system, then Aston Martin had to wait three years before they were allowed to put it in theirs. So, I mean, he was like, you know, it doesn't make sense in cars that cost 150,000 pounds to have, you know, this stuff that is three years old. And so um, I think they still are going to be using Mercedes infotainment tech, but they'll just get all the newest stuff the same time Mercedes gets it. I think this is certainly being helped by the fact that the AMG, former AMG CEO, is now the CEO of Aston Martin. And so he's probably greased the wheels there a little bit to make things a little bit more of a level playing field here. Um, but anyway, so they claim as far as the infotainment that the new models will get the newest tech, but with their own faces, our own voices, a proper English accent. This is a fun little touch. Um, 
getting back to the mechanical changes though, he says, you'll be very impressed with the all new front engines next year. There's no similarity at all to the current cars, but they did say there's going to be some carryover at the rear, but um, it, you know, it's really going to be heavily reworked. Um, so it sounds like they'll probably still keep the names. If he's saying how it's not like an all new model, these are just heavily reworked, uh, you know, current versions. So We'll see about all that, but um, he also added that um, these changes will make these cars feel like what those cars should have always felt like. Um, I've never driven any of those three, so I can't say personally, but I don't think they drive badly, at least from the stuff I've seen. Um, I would very happily drive any three of them, but um, you know, it sounds like they'll be even better here with these changes, so that's all good. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the other plans here, they say the reveal will be happening around the end of this year for these models and sales will be starting in 2023 for all of them. And uh, he also says the engines are likely going to be, he didn't say this, but they'll be likely enhanced uh, versions of the AMG v they currently use. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's going to be anything wildly different there. Just, you know, nice improvements. And I think there was mentions of, you know, the motors being built in-house, just like how it is for the DBX 707. Um, and, uh, so the other great tidbit here was that the V12 is safe for the next several years thanks to a new car and driver report. Also, I think at this event, they interviewed Aston Martin CEO um, who said that the V12 still has a bit of potential and that having the V12 Vantage shows there is still room for a V12 in our sports car generation. And so this means the V12 should stick around in everything that it's currently in, meaning basically the DB11 and the DBS. Um, and he did confirm there's no plans to put it in the DBX, unfortunately, which I was really hoping they put the V12 in the DBX. Um, that would really be a cool differentiator again from everything else that's V8 powered. But sounds like that's not in the cards, unfortunately. Uh, but when they asked him about how other car companies are getting rid of their V12s, like just, you know, last week we were talking about how, you know, BMW is getting rid of the V12 in the 7 Series. Um... He responded with, why should I get rid of the V12 for the time being? Um, because, you know, I guess BMW is just getting rid of it ahead of time because there's the Euro 7 standards coming in sometime between 2025 and 2026, most likely. And so some car companies are spanning them early. But Aston Martin plans to sell them right up to that uh, deadline, basically, for those emission standards. And maybe even a little bit beyond because he says um, the life cycle for the V12s is around 2026 to 2027 anyway. At that point, he says, we're not going to re-engineer the V12 to meet those new standards, sadly. So the V12 will not last forever. We've got about four more years here to enjoy ordering brand new V12 Aston Martins for those of you lucky enough to do that. Um, four more years is what you got. And then beyond that, you know, we'll have to just enjoy the used stuff here for the rest of time. But, um, you know, so it's sad that it will be ending. And then, you know, we'll see pl plug-in hybrid V8s probably last a little while longer and stuff and see what happens as we go closer to the 2030s. But, um, you know, so that's a little bit unfortunate. And I hope, you know, since they say the engines have a lifespan to 2026, 2027, I hope they don't end them early if Euro 7 does actually come into effect in 2025. I hope that they just say, hey, final edition DBS and DB11 V12s, we tack on an extra 50 grand for the fines for <laughs> Euro 7 stuff, and you pay 50 grand more for a final edition just to have a 2027 model year final edition DBS with the V12 in its very last form. Um, you know, but we'll have to see what they end up doing with all that. But anyway, good to see the V12 sticking around for a few more years, but sad to, you know, finally learn its uh, death date here. So uh, crazy to hear that. Rolls-Royce this week, another uh, exotic car news here. They revealed a new Spirit of Ecstasy hood ornament here. They say it's been streamlined to be more aerodynamic for their new Spectre electric car. And they say, for Spectre and beyond, she becomes lower and more focused, braced for unprecedented speed and the exciting future her presence will define. So they spent 830 hours designing and wind testing the new ornament. And uh, they did add that all the current models will continue to use the traditional ornament for now. And they also did add that all the ornaments are still hand polished and handcrafted so that no one is identical to another they're all minutely different as part of the whole you know hand uh, hand on approach here with building these cars and the bespoke nature of, of them and so 
anyway, still cool to see that. You know, it's all about just making the vehicle more aerodynamic and having a huge hood ornament on the front of it certainly does not help the aerodynamics in an electric car, which is very important. So streamlining it a little bit, but I'm glad they're still keeping it around and, uh, you know, not trying to do some type of like projected hologram or something else crazy. There was still a physical hood ornament, which is cool. And so anyway, cool to see that. Uh, Jaguar has reportedly uh, been hard at work on their EVs as well. So during an investor call with them, Auto Car was reporting that their CFO um, said that they were looking for an electric vehicle platform that suits their standards, but that they haven't been able to find one yet and instead are just planning to make their own EV platform called Panthera. And um, their CEO added that concerning the new Jaguar, we're making unique proportions a priority. That's the reason why the, at the moment we do it by ourselves. And he said at the moment, suggesting these plans could change if someone has a platform that can actually accommodate the proportions they're going for. Um, but they don't have much time to be flexible on this if they actually want to hit their uh, projected target date here of 2025 is when they want to have their first of these new gen EVs on the road, um, or at least revealed. And so... Yeah, you know, they got you know, three, four years tops here to, you know, do all that development. It's going to be tough. So hopefully they can just either run with this new platform or find something very, very quickly um, in order to do this. But um, so that's an interesting thing. And Autocar also adds that in Jaguar's pursuit of selling fewer cars at higher profit, that's kind of their new thing. They're going to get, be going after like Bentley and Aston Martin. I covered that last year, which is I don't know how that's going to work out for them, but that's their plan. Um, and so because of that, they're considering, according to Autocar, it's going down to a three-car lineup instead of the multiple vehicles they have currently. So it would just be two SUVs and a sports car, and that would be it for the entire Jaguar range. Um, but again, they'd be much more expensive and higher tech, you know, higher luxury, all that kind of stuff. We'll see if that turns out to actually, you know, pan out for them, um, but very interesting to hear that. And lastly, Japanese newspaper Nikkei is uh, claiming that Nissan will quit its development of gas engines in all major markets. Technically, there's a caveat here, but the ending gas engine development in all major markets except for the U.S. And even here in the U.S., they're claiming that it'll be mostly just to continue limited development of truck engines since they still think there'll be demand for that and there's no regulations really for them. So, um, you know, that's... I think the only thing that they are claiming now, this is not confirmed by Nissan. I have to add, this is just a report still. We'll see what Nissan says officially. Um, but they say that otherwise, um, they claim all the resources and engineers we put into EV development here. Um, and they already stopped doing gas engine development for Europe. Um, so that's mostly just due to the Euro 7 standards once again, making it, according to Nissan, so expensive to develop gas engines that it wouldn't be economically feasible for them to do that for affordable vehicles. Um, and so they say that, um, yeah, they'll you know, have to just go for the EV stuff, especially in Europe, but now they're extending it to the rest of the world, essentially. Um, and so it, even though this isn't too surprising, considering I mean, everyone else is saying how they're going to, you know, end gas engine development here little by little, um, this is the first Japanese car company to effectively cancel gas engine development for most of their markets. But the caveat here is the report does add that um, they will continue to develop gas engines for hybrid setups and they'll con still continue to refine existing engines. They just want to be developing new ones. So, um, you know, I mean, the, exist the existing engines being refined, that's something that everyone else is doing. Like Audi already announced they're, you know, not doing any new gas engine development. But they will continue to, you know, refine the old ones. So that could really keep the old ones around indefinitely, honestly, depending on what the demand is there. Um, and also if they're developing new engines for hybrid setups, I mean, hybrid, you can really stretch that to mean anything. You could have a GTR, which still has, you know, a twin turbo V6 that does 800 horsepower and then have, you know, a 50 horsepower electric motor on it to help it out a little bit. That would still fall under this, you know, caveat. So, you know, it's not the end of the world if you're a fan of Nissan gas engines, but uh, just kind of crazy to hear, you know, if this does turn out to be true, you know, they're making uh, a little bit of a bigger commitment than a lot of the other Japanese car companies are currently. And so we'll see how that all works out for them. But um, yeah, it's just, you know, lots and lots of companies investing billions and billions of dollars going for the CV thing. Um, and it sounds like, you know, most companies here are at the point of no return. And especially with the new standards in Europe, 
it just makes sense to switch everything over here. So uh, we'll see how that all you know pans out. But that is also one of the reasons why they're not even offering the new Nissan Z in Europe because that engine is not going to be compliant with the new standards, and they're not even going to bother to bring it over for a few years and then take it away, you know, because it's just not worth it, I guess, from a life cycle standpoint. So um, crazy stuff. And yeah, we'll you know keep tabs on this and see if it does turn out to be officially confirmed here soon. But anyway, that's it for all the news this week, guys. So let me know your thoughts on all this stuff in the comments below. Thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.